Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, we're going to continue our study on Samson in the book of Judges, putting this on the line. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful uh, for all of your blessings. And this past week, and we're thankful for this new week and uh, for the study that we will have this ap afternoon. We ask, Lord, that uh, you can lead those who need to hear uh, the simplicity of the lines presented, either to be there in person or to watch it later. We know, Lord, that um, your spirit is always speaking to human hearts, and we ask, Lord, that we can respond, that we can be an influence for good. We pray for each person in this movement and in our study here today. Uh, we ask that you can help us with the struggles that we face as we grow closer to Christ. And Lord, we are thankful for um, the truths in your word that convict us. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to continue to do this work upon our hearts as we study together. Be with us now in this study. May you guide and lead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, good morning again. And, uh, yeah, so it's 40 years today since I was baptized, which means something to me. It's a long time ago. And... Time keeps going on, and there's so many things that I've learned since I've become a Seventh-day Adventist that uh, I would not have imagined. Now, in our study that we've been going through here, and my eSort is still opening up, um, when, we, when we were looking at the story of Samson and his uh, um, the, the, his wife, his his wife that he sort of had. Um, <clears throat> we know that we have that line. So if we're going to draw that line, um, the idea is that we're going to place that over top of chapter thirteen. So chapter. Chapter 14 is going to lay over top of chapter 13. That is, it's a repeat and enlarge. Um, so we would say it's a zoom into the same way mark. So what is the way mark that we're zooming into? How is it that we're understanding this? If anybody can sort of sum this up for us. How do we understand Samson as a way mark? Because Samson's a message. What message is it? He's a type of Christ. Okay, he's a type of Christ. <clears throat> and, and he has a particular message, right, which, which is presented in this a morally ironic narrative. Right, so even though he's a type of Christ, he has this ne negative aspect. But if we're going to take a way mark and say, in our application... Because we're making an application of judges covering from 9-11, from 2001 to 2023. And so Samson is a way mark that, um, that we zoom into. So with, with chapter 13, we zoomed into July 18th. That was our understanding of that way mark. So how do we, are we going to zoom into July 18th for each of these waymarks? For each of these chapters, is, is that going to be the waymark that we look at? At least at the beginning. Okay. Um. 
So what do you mean at least at the beginning? So how would we? We have to examine these to see exactly how everything is going to fit. And okay. so as we're examining, we're going to be comparing this with July 18th. We're going to be comparing it with other things to see exactly how well it fits. Okay. Yeah. So, so we need to, we need to um, sort of by trial and error, I guess, is, is how we would look at it. I mean, we have some, things that have guided us. We look at the symbols that are there and we then uh, try to match those symbols with the way marks that we have already established. So, um, just gonna bring this up here. So when it says Samson went down to Timnath and saw the women of Timnath, the daughters of the Philistines, um, and he wants to have this, this woman who's the daughter of the Philistines, this woman that he's seen, he wants to, to have this as his wife. And, and his father and his mother, uh, what would they represent? So if we're going to look at these symbols, we have a woman that represents a church, um, or at least a religion, right? religious idea but we have a father and a mother and they want him to take instead uh, a daughter among of thy brethren or among all of my people but instead they want it you know samson wants to take this wife of an uncircumcised philistine and so we know that we can apply this to our line but we can see that this does apply other places right That this this can represent things that have happened in the Adventist Church as well as other times in history. Okay, <clears throat> so we have Samson, the subject, and it said here that he went down to Timnath. Mm -hmm. Where else in the Bible do we find somebody going to Timnath? Um, yeah, so that was, uh, we, I think we looked at this before. Um, wasn't it in Chronicles or something? Anyway, do you, can you tell us? My computer's running slow because it's... Genesis 38. It's, oh, it's in Genesis 38. Because... Right, okay. Judah, our first mention here with Timnath, or what could be the first mention, we have Judah going up to his sheep shearers in Timnath. Right. So we're given an example. Here is Samson going down to a city controlled by the Philistines. Here is Judah going up to a city controlled by the Philistines. The down or up just depends on where you're coming. <clears throat> no, I, I agree. Yeah. So, yeah. So he's going to go to Timnath to share his sheep. And this is, of course, going to be the situation with Tamar. Exactly. Right. Because uh, in, in, in the following verse that that is here, and it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up Timnath to shear his sheep. Mm -hmm. Now, Joshua 15.10, we have another mention of this because it was to be one of the borders for one of the tribes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and 15.57 uh, mentions it, too, in, in the connection with that. And then Second Chronicles 28. 18, um, the Philistines also had invaded the cities of the low country, the south of Judah, and taken Beth Shemesh, and Ajalon, and Gedereth, and Shoko, and the villages thereof, and Timna, which it calls Timna, not Timnath, of the villages thereof. So it just mentions it in Second Chronicles. 
And um, so it's mentioned, but the only one where we really have anything happening is the only ones are in Judges and also in Genesis 38, 13, where we have something. Isn't it interesting that in both situations, you have one of the children of Israel engaging in a are seeking to engage in a relationship that is not permissible under the law. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and of course, these are an area controlled by the Philistines. And the idea here then is um, this is a relation with, with, the Gentiles or with the pagans. Right. False worship, false understanding, false teaching. Now they're, they're quite different stories otherwise, but, uh, but you have that, that characteristic there. Now with, um, uh, of course, the story of Samson, we, we can just take that the relationships with the daughters of the religions around you is forbidden. And, um, and that's not, not, of course, the case in Judges 38, but it has to do with that we have the city that has this false or you know, uh, wrong type of relationship. It's forbidden. Forbidden relationship. This is a different one in in Judges, but we can see that this happens again and again with God's people. So Samson, um, being a type of Christ, he's having this relationship which is morally unacceptable, but Christ is going to take upon himself human nature to save mankind, and in a, in a certain sense you know, in a particular way, there is a parallel because he's taking upon himself a sinful human nature. But yet he's doing it to save mankind. And we can see here that this was the Lord's, uh, it's, it's um, the Lord um, is behind this, that it was of the Lord that this is going to happen. So, yeah, so the, the question in the chat has to do with Timnath Harris. So that's, uh, uh, which is Timnath of the Sun and Timnath Sarah, which we talked about before, which appear to be the same place. Um, but I don't think, it, I don't know if this is the same, same location or if this is some other location. I don't know if anybody wants to go into that, that direction there. But what we do have here is that we know that, that this was of the Lord, but God is using this nature of Samson, his desire for God's glory, right? So even in the story, even though we have this ironic morality, uh, God is still behind this story, just as he was behind uh, sending Christ to redeem humanity. So there's something about this story that that on the surface doesn't make sense, that God is going to take Samson's sexual desire and utilize it to God's glory. So Rand shows there that that phrase there adds up to 525. Uh, Matthew there. Um, so, so we have this story here, and, and I guess part of what we're looking at with Samson being a type of Christ, 
that the, the focus of this is upon the cross, that is, the cross is the center of a chiasm. And, you know, I would say that we probably are, are zooming into July 18th story. That is, we're repeating the story of chapter 13, the, the line of chapter 13 with a different story, but it's going to illustrate some, some of the same things, or at least uh, demonstrate that this line is correct that we had in chapter 13. Now, that line we had based upon this chiastic structure, um, which was, bring it up. Maybe I lost that one again. I don't understand when I do this. So, let's do this one. Okay. Sorry about that. So I'm trying to bring up the other drawing that we had, and it's not bringing this up. Okay, here it is now. Seems like the same problem that I've been having before. It's not saving things properly. Hmm. Well, I'm going to have to figure that out. I don't know why that happens. It shouldn't really be happening. I should be able to just open up the file that I had before. I don't know how to do this. <clears throat> I don't know where my diagram went. It should have been there. It was all saved properly, but it's not there. Um, so anyway, so one of the things we looked at was Judges 14.4. And we asked a question regarding Judges 14.4. Does, do we have any significance there with the symbol of 144? Now, one of the things that we see here is that we see parallel with chapter 13 is that his father and his mother do not know that it was the Lord that it was of the Lord, right? And that's that's the same lack of knowledge that we saw in chapter 13. So how do we understand this? Anyone? Well, <clears throat> as, as we're given other examples, we have a situation from Genesis 21 where Ishmael and his mother were dwelling in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took for him a wife out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> we know that she was Egyptian. She was not of the children of Israel. 
but Ishmael was the son of Abraham. Yeah. So was this God's plan that she should then take a wife for her son out of Egypt? I would say in the situation that it was. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. But. So here we have this example with Samson that's being given to us. And what he is saying to his parents is, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Mm -hmm. Samson had been brought up understanding that he was a Nazarite, that he was a children, he was of the children of Israel. He was especially set aside for the service of God. Yet he does everything in his power to turn away from this blessing that had been placed upon him mm -hmm. and to walk separately from God. So in this story, we are being shown someone that is walking contrary, but as we're taking this in an ironic sense, we have one that is walking according to the path that Christ would have walked, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at this, we have multiple examples of what was to be done and what was not to be done. But in these examples, we're also being shown that God's hand is in control. Mm -hmm. Was God's hand in control in the situation with Judah and Tamar? Well, God, God's hand's always in control, ultimately. He, but in that case, he's, he's taking that situation and using it One is to instruct them. Right. Um, but it's, it's a type of correction. Okay, now, comment in the chat was that Joshua had chosen Timnath as his inheritance. Would that not have made it of the tribe of Manasseh? Or am I confusing this? I don't know. Here's my diagram. But as you're as you're speaking, also this the lead up to verse 14, 4, that his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Yeah, so she pleaseth me well. Yep, so it is in Hebrew, ayin, which is eyes, and yashar, which means straight or even. So she's straight in my eyes, literally. Okay. 
So it's interesting that that verse begins with both of his parents speaking with him, and he responds only to his father. <clears throat> He's not responding to his mother. And he makes the comment, get her for me. Yeah. So why is it that he's not wanting to respond to his mother, but he chooses to respond to his father? And why is he trying to give instruction to his father? Well, I mean, the father's the one who has to arrange the marriage. I mean, so. But are you saying it in some kind of symbolic sense? Yes, it is. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, well, we, we haven't really decided who the father and mother represent or what they represent. Okay, so anyway, here's here's the line that I had drawn just, just to remind us of Judges 13.13 13 being the center of this chiasm, right? So this was chapter 13. Now, when we look at chapter 14, um, there are symbols that can tie us back to 9-11. So what you're talking about here, at least what I see, that this has to do with the church. I mean, I could be wrong in how I'm understanding this. But Samson comes from his father and mother. I mean, we addressed that already in chapter 13. And we addressed the idea of 9-11 um, with um, spiritual formation and the things that had happened there, that those things are being illustrated or shown. So that marks 9-11. And so we can mark 9-11 here um, in chapter 14 with the father and mother and, and what's happening with Samson. But Samson is a message that, that comes from Adventism, right? That's how we've understood it. I would believe so. Now with the symbol of 14.4 then, I mean, it says, but his father and mother knew not that it was the Lord that he sought, that he, Samson, sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. And can we say this, spiritually speaking, regarding 9-11? Okay, but you just applied the he as... Samson. As Samson. But... Right. That's how we have to understand it. He refers to Samson. If you read it, because it's Samson's sexual desire. That's what's being talked about. The Lord doesn't have a sexual desire. Because this occasion is, is referring to sexual desire. So that he's referring to Samson. But Samson is not looking at that point to go up against the Philistines. No, but that's not what it's saying. That's what I'm saying is that the King James, the way they translate this, because they're trying to be um, delicate. Uh, yeah. Delicate. <laughs> they, they're not going to write, they're not going to translate it directly. So, so that's, so it's not, it's not talking about going against the Philistines. Right. So if, if we were going to translate this sentence, um, you know, sort of properly, but his father and his mother knew not it, that it was of the Lord. Now, we have this clause at the end, for at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. 
So God is going to use the fact that Samson is going to want to have these sexual relations with this Philistine wife, right? Um, so, so God has a purpose in it, but it's Samson is the one who is seeking this sexual union with this Philistine woman. And God's going to use that because, because of the fact that the Philistines have dominion over Israel. So Samson isn't doing that because the Philistines have dominion over Israel. Samson has no intention really other than his sexual desire. But this is still of the Lord because God has a purpose. Now, so when we try to apply this, I mean, here we have this in a verse that is a symbol of the 144,000. And, you know, Iran uh, reminds us that uh, um, Samson, the, the sum is 81, and the reverse sum is 81. So it has, it has a doubling of 81. Is that what you're saying, Iran? Yeah, it's 81 either way. Yeah, which is pretty interesting. Um, so that gives us this idea of a mirror. Right? And 81 represents. What do we have it represent? Priests. Yeah, so it's it's the priests. And um so if we're if we're gonna make an application here, so we have it, how would you do that, Iran? How would you take the name of Samson being 81, both in sum and reverse sum in Gematria? Uh, how would you use that? How would you apply that? Maybe it's something about the priests at midnight. Okay. So the doubling gives us the midnight symbol. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. And, and we can apply this to July 18th. Right? We should be able to do that in understanding that as a symbol of this doubling. And, and one of the things about um, midnight and midnight cry is they are a doubling. That is, originally they were the same way mark. Midnight and midnight cry, we eventually differentiated them. But at first, we didn't have that understanding. We just thought the cry went out at midnight. That's the midnight cry. It happens at midnight. We didn't know that there was Boston. We just knew there was Exeter. We're like all Adventists know, they don't know about Boston. They take the events that actually occurred at Boston and they place them at Exeter, uh, mostly because of Loughborough's misreading, the misunderstanding of that history. So he puts the riding of the horse at, uh, at Exeter when it actually occurs at Boston. And this does illustrate things in our movement, right? That is our movement's understanding of these way marks. Is, I mean, in a sense, Adventism loses the understanding of that. But it's, it's the discovering of these way marks gradually in this movement that it becomes this symbol of what happens uh, what happened in the past becomes a symbol of what happens in the present. So we, we've seen this all throughout Millerite history. Um, so we, so now we have this this verse where we see um, the father and the mother don't understand that this is from God, right? They don't see that God is behind this. And with what um, Dwight was talking about, that God's purposes are going to be worked out. But this is based upon a character defect in Samson. So God is going to use Samson's sexual desire 
to in, in his purposes against the Philistines in delivering them from the Philistines. And, and so Samson's story, you know, it, it seems to me one of complete failure, morally speaking, on the part of Samson. And yet it's going to be this victory. And, and Samson being a type of Christ becomes this, uh, you know, this sunlight um, becoming this, uh, you know, powerful symbol. And especially as we apply it to this movement. So, so we can see that it, it applies to Christ. Samson applies to Christ as a symbol, but also to this movement, to a specific message within this movement, the message of July 18th. Now, we also dealt with this whole idea of the riddle. So in the riddle, we see a parallel with what happens in chapter 13. How do we see the riddle as a parallel? Because chapter 13, we have the knowing and the not knowing and the knowing. The name not known, the name known. Is it that chapter 14 is going to add to our information of chapter 13? Um, yes, that's what we're trying to say, is that chapter 14 is adding to that. So we're going to take this riddle as relating to this revelation of understanding. Now, the riddle dealing with Palmoni, right? Because that's um, part of what we've understood here in chapter 14. So in trying to, to take these symbols, he has this riddle. And remember with this riddle, you're gonna have the 30, 30, 30 again, right? Correct. And, and we, we understood that if you take this, uh, 300 and um, 303,030, which is if we just lay them up 30, 30, 30 as a number, and you divide it by 12, you get 25,252.5, right? So you have this, this symbol that can tie us to the 777 structure. And so we've had that. Um, you know, it happens two other times. We have this happen three times, this 30, 30, 30 in the story of Judges. And it is a symbol. 30, of course, is a symbol of a month. And three is the symbol of the three days. So it, it ties into everything that we've been studying throughout the book of Judges. So we, we have to take that symbol as, as a consistent symbol pointing to the 777 structure. And what we had done with chapter 13, just to remind us um, in this diagram is really, we have the seven seven structure here at the beginning and we have it here in the middle. We haven't specifically established it in the end yet, but I believe we will in some way, however that's going to be, whether it's gonna be 777 days or something else. Um, 777 months or 777 weeks or, or something to that effect that we could uh, make an application, but we haven't, we haven't figured that out yet. But we can see that this, this structure here in the center, even though we have July 18th, this is all part of a structure that's in the center. So it's not just July 18th, it's these other way marks. And we can see that November 9th, of course, is tied November 9th, 2019, to both November 9th, 1989, and to 9-11. And um, if we're going to see this, this structure, we know that it's divided as to 252 days, right? So I, you know, I need to I'll do it this way, just so we can clearly see this. So remember, we got the 252 days here, 
and which Stephen first noticed um, when we first came up with July 18th. Um, and then the 525 days. Right? Correct. So, <clears throat> so this becomes an important symbol if we take that 30, 30, 30. So I'm just going to do it here like this. Even though it doesn't really belong here in this. Just going to show you divided by 12 equals right so we have this symbol here oops I did this backwards All right so that's the number equals so to me that's a pretty powerful symbol of that 30 30 30. So we will end up putting this in, in our long dealing with chapter 14. So with chapter 14, I should be able to take this, this line and put it down here. So I know we don't got a lot of room on this. Maybe I should do it on another diagram, but for now we're just gonna put it down here. We have this line at the bottom and, uh, so when we're going to take Samson himself as this symbol, he's going, to, he's going to be in the center of this. So let's do it this way. I'll move this over here. So I, again, I'm just going to put July 18 in the center. But Samson's going to be 81. And then I'll do this here. This does maybe make sense to people. But that's his gematria, his 81, frontwards and backwards. So I just put it both ways. So is that strange to have it be, the gematria be 81 both, both directions? Okay. So to explain reverse gematria. So what you do with gematria, yes, it's very strange. Um, because you take the letter A is 1 and B is 2, et cetera, right? And, and normally, if you're going to do that and you take a name and you do a reverse gematria, then Z is one, Y is two, et cetera. So to have the name be the same, add up to the same, whether in the regular sum or the reverse sum, that's pretty unusual, right? It, I don't know statistically to show how often it would occur. Uh, but it definitely would not occur very often. I, I don't know if I've ever seen it before. Uh, around you, have you seen it very often or any other time? I don't know if I've ever seen that. Okay, because I've never seen it, except here in the name Samson. And, and so it, it puts us in the middle of a chiasm again. So remember in... Chapter 13, it was the 1313 that gave us the center of the chiasm. I guess I probably should, well, I'm putting it in the center of this page here. So it's not above, it's not directly below July 18 above, but you can see the idea here that you have this symbol that gives us this mirror and it's Samson's name himself. So we put the message of Samson as the message of July 18th because of that symbol. Is, does that make sense to people? Yes, as many times as we've noticed the mirror, mm -hmm. this just makes it that much stronger. Yeah. 
Now, one of the things about the mirror, of course, because we had a lot of discussion regarding um, uh, the looking glass. And so one of the things we see that we, well, we've seen both symbolically and also in our lives personally is that these lines are showing us the looking glass. Now, I want to, just going back to that, I just want to touch on one point that that's often goes missed, and I know I've touched on it before, but um, it's good to repeat some of these things. When we deal with the book of Isaiah, chapter 8, and it's going to talk about Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, um, when he says, moreover, and this is in 8, verse 1, so I want you to note that, right? So we, we have the number 81 here, representing the priests. But we see that in the name of Samson, it's in a mirror. Correct? So when right. it says, moreover, the Lord said unto me, take thee a great roll and write in it with a man's pen concerning Mahershala Hashbaz. If you look at this word roll, it, it says a tablet for writing by analogy, a mirror as a plate, a glass, a roll. And, and it, this is a great roll, the doll, right? So, um, yeah, the Isaiah 8 one is interesting in that respect. Mm hmm. Right, so we have Isaiah 8, 1, which mentions this mirror and that he's going to take this mirror and write upon it with a man's pen. Um, and I took unto me faithful witness to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah. And I went unto the prophetess and she conceived and bare a son. And then said the Lord to me, call his name Mahershala Hashbaz. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria, which means by the king of Syria. And the Lord spake also unto me again, saying, for as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shaloa that go softly and rejoice in reason and Remaliah's son. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of a river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory, and he shall come up over the banks, over all his channels, and go over all his banks, and he shall pass through Judah, and shall overflow, and go over. He shall reach to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. So we know this is connected with the previous chapter, chapter 7, where it talks about this child that's going to be born, now, some people try to say, well, this child that's going to be born is going to be referring to Maher Shala Hashbaz. Uh, but no, because that child that's going to be born in chapter 7 is a descendant of David. It's of the house of David. So it's a different child. But Isaiah is going to have a child as well. And um, so there's this connection of this symbol, though. Isaiah having a child um, is is in a sense, almost like a prophecy of the child that's going to be born, born of the house of David, which is going to be Manasseh. So, so there's a whole bunch of things here that we, as a movement, really haven't addressed in detail. I mean, I've studied them out in detail, and I've put parts of these in my papers, but there's actually a lot more about chapter 7 uh, to 12 that we haven't really addressed. And and it was when I was having this struggle over 742 BC and 723 BC, and that I was basically ready to give up on the 2520, that the Lord uh, spoke to me in the middle of the night and told me to read these chapters. And those chapters were an absolute revelation to me, to read all of the chapters, because I was focusing upon chapter 7 and had not read the rest of this. So... So that 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 was in 2014, and that really uh, changed what I understood about this message. I, I don't know if I could have 
um, supported the 2520 if I didn't understand correctly these chapters. But um, anyway, we, we can see here this symbol of 81 in connection with a mirror and in connection with this message about the Sunday law, right? So this, right, because that's what Assyria is gonna be symbolizing coming over, you know, up to the neck. And of course we have the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom involved in this civil war. So, I mean, it should be obvious to us that all these things are fitting together, right? I would have to agree. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so we have this mirror, and and eighty one is representing this mirror, and Samson is, in this very odd way, uh, reverse and um, and is the regular sum, forward sum, gematric sum. Uh, here being represented. So it's just pretty interesting, to say the least. Yeah. <clears throat> so just, um, here, I'm just going to show you this just so people can see this. So what you have here, this is uh, web.palmonai.org forward slash gematria. This is um, Rand's site on his palmonai.org site that you can find this calculator. And you can see they have the normal sum. So what they've done is they've taken the letter S is number 19, A is number one, M is number 13, again an S is number 19, and then O and N are 15 and 14. You add them together, you get 81. And then you can create a product by multiplying them together. And then we have a reverse sum and that's just going to, you're going to see that in this case, S is eight, right? So you can see how, you know, A becomes 26, you know, and M becomes 14 instead of 13, right? So these ones are reversed, flipped around. Um, so it just so happens that the name Samson produces this, right? These two 81s. So it, it's... It's pretty interesting. Okay. And, and so I think that should be clear to everyone how, how we derive this. So we have July 18th as the center of this chiasm, even though it's not literally the center of the 777 days, it's the center of those three Sabbaths, right? November 9th. 2019, July 18, 2020, and December 25, 2021. They become these three Sabbaths. And what was the significance that we had that there was these three Sabbaths? Uh, and this goes back to Odilio uh, addressing this. Anybody know? Anybody know what these three Sabbaths represented? Okay, the three sevens, right? So Rand put that note there. We have these three sevens. Now, we also had this particular interesting fact that remember this November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 2021 is 777 days. Though technically, if I usually write this, I write an I, a lowercase I, to show that it's inclusive or an ordinal count, which is not the case with the 777 days from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021. We count that cardinally. Now, when we have July 18th as the 26th day of the fourth month, on both the biblical and the rabbinic calendar, which it isn't always, you know, that the two line up. And we have uh, a cardinal count of 777 days from the Julian dates that we have, or Gregorian dates, either Julian or Gregorian, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but from those dates on our calendar, from our, our Roman calendars, 
that this is the first time that this coincidence occurs. That is, if we go back to every other November 9th, and, and also that they're all Sabbaths, uh, if we go back to any other span in recorded, like from the time of the creation of the world to till now, we never have in any other time, the 26th day of the fourth month being July 18th and the Sabbath and with December 25th on the right side and November 9th on the left side being also Sabbaths and being 777 days cardinally apart. So it's a unique set of circumstances and that that's unusual. Right, So you have to have all these things come together. A cardinal count of 777 days. These same dates falling all on Sabbaths and July 18th being both the 26th day of the fourth month on the biblical and the rabbinic calendars. So, so when we look at this... Um, the 777 days then. I mean, this becomes a really unique situation, the center of this chiasm. And then to have something like Samson's name here being 81 both reverse and forward gematria, I think is, is, is very interesting. Okay, so we got part of this now, at least we have the center of this chiasm, but I think that we would have to take this story. So if we want to get this 9-11 here, we, we would we would start this as at November 9th. So I'm just copying this here. So, or not November 9th, wouldn't we put this as 9-11? Um, so let's do it that way. I'll just put this as 9-11. So we're going to put that at the beginning, whatever that means. But why are we putting 9-11 at the beginning of this line? We have some symbols there that we recognized. Now, we don't have Stephen here right now, um, but he did do a... Um, a post on WhatsApp. I don't know if anybody saw it. But, uh, so on, on the Unity group there. Uh, I'm just opening it up. It takes a second. And and he was dealing with this um, this idea that the Neo Assyrian Empire began on. 9-11 BC, and that there's 2,911 years uh, between that date and, uh, so can I just do it this way? And 2001. Now, now, I'm not sure how Stephen did this. That is, I'm not sure why he did this. Now, I have, you know, 912 for the first year of um, Adad Nirari the second. So, oops, and I'm going to. Didn't want to do it this way. Did you see? Okay, so I can close this. Let's do it this way. Um, sorry about that. So this is the WhatsApp image.
Now, to try to see if there's any real relevance in this. Um, so uh, this guy, Adad Nirari II, who's, they give his accession to the throne um, as the start of the Nero, Neo-Assyrian Empire. So whether that's the correct place to place it or not, I don't know. But even if we didn't have that, could we not see that there's something about the fact that if we take 9-11 BC, that it's 2,911 years to 9-11-2001? Um, so here he has this uh, shooting forth of the Assyrian Empire that he's connecting to the shooting forth of Israel. And, and we, we have that de dealing with um, the beginning of the latter reign, right? He stay, stayeth his rough wind in the day of the east wind, Isaiah 27, verse 8. So I'm, I'm not sure all that Stephen is thinking about this. Uh, but we should be able to see that now it's 2,911 years. Um, is it significant that it's 2,911 years? And of course, we could see we're really taking the 2,001 is 2,000 years. So somebody could say, well, that's just going to happen with any, any date. Um, So is this is this a valid way of looking at something? It's just uh, I know it's a bit of an aside. I would think that. Okay, why would it not be valid? Okay, so first. We don't know if the Neo-Assyrian Empire actually begins at 911 BC, right? So that's that's one question. I mean, it, I, it, it just oh, looks like he's using uh, Wikipedia as its reference. Yeah, I know, but I, I don't use Wikipedia. I use uh, Gerard Gerto, um because his aligns with the Bible, which Wikipedia doesn't. That's a long explanation of how, how he works out the kings of Assyria. Uh, he's an Egyptologist, but also an Assyriologist. So, um, but anyway, I mean, all we can do, we can do this with any year. That is, if you take a year BC, it, it will, add, and you add 2,000 years, it will go to 2001, right? So, but of course we have in 2001, we have the date 9-11. So he's gonna use 9-11 BC. So any three digit year, I guess is what we would say. And so, so there's not really anything particular about that, except that he's connecting this with the Neo-Assyrian empire when he shot forth. So he's, he's using this shooting forth and he stayeth his rough wind in the day of the east wind which comes from these verses to tie us back to the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Now, can we connect the Neo-Assyrian Empire with 9-11? I mean, that's going to be, and they call it Neo-Assyrian because you have the old Assyrian Empire, this is the new one, right? Just like you have the Neo-Babylonian Empire uh, with Nebuchadnezzar, with his dad, um, Nabopolassar, right? So, so you have these um, these kingdoms. So the question is, is that significant? He's just picking up on the nine eleven BC. That that that's when Wikipedia gives the start with the beginning of the accession of Adad Nirari the second in nine eleven BC. Now it, it could be that he was actually acceded to the throne. Uh, in 911 BC, but his reign begins in 912. So that, that is possible. Uh, I haven't looked into details of how he comes to the throne, how much we know about him. 
But I would also question whether that you would use that to mark the beginning of the Neo-Assyrian Neo Empire uh, to begin with. So why it's why they're starting it with him, I'm not particularly certain. Um, but anyway, you know, we deal with this idea of 9-11. So the thing that I wanted to address here is this 2911. So we have 2,911 years. So it's it's really uh, just adding 2,000 to 911, which is always going to work out this way. So is there any significance, though, having to in connection with 9-11? Does that represent a doubling is all I'm trying to say. And it's kind of a roundabout way of looking at things. So when we look at 9-11 and we see that it's also 11-9, so, so again, just like we did above there, I'm going to do here again. Oops. Does this make sense to people what I'm doing here at the beginning with what's in the center? That there is something about 9-11 and 11.9 that tie together and that we can see that that occurs with this 81 symbol. And, and the 81 symbol we can see is representing the date 18, just in reverse. And in the story of Samson, so if we go back here, to the story of Samson in chapter 14 of Judges. Um, we have this, what, what, would, what occurs at 9-11 for us is this spiritual formation. And is this being represented here in this story? And, and, Are and you the talking question, about in the marriage? Yes. And, and <laughs> Samson's desire. Right. Because, see, the problem here we have with the story is, is Samson is representing the message of July 18th. But the origins of Samson's message, the thing that we're looking at is that we know that this message is not, is not fully realized until the end. Right. Because if we look at Millerite history, the Millerites, you know, if you start with 1798 with Miller getting his concordance, there's going to be this progression of light, right? Because we're in a period of darkness. It's a reform line. And as they move through this line, truths are established, but they're not fully understood. Right? We, when we examined the foundation, we could see where they were being led by God, even though they had some false understandings. Correct? Correct. Right. Which is like in our own personal lives. I mean, when we first come to God, we definitely don't have a complete understanding of things. But God is with us all along the way. As we continue to follow him, we have more light for our feet. Our experience deepens. Things that we once believed, practices that we once practiced, those things are set aside. And we accept the new light and the new change in our life occurs. And this is true of the Millerite movement. This is true of any reform line, whether on the individual or national or church. It, it's always going to be the same because God's dealings with men are ever the same. They show up in this everlasting gospel of the three-step testing prophetic message. So when it comes to Samson, I mean, 
this message really begins at 9-11. I mean, we could say, you know, 1989, but Samson is not the first angel's message, right? We're understanding that this is the second angel's message that's being focused upon in the book of Judges. It's going from 9-11 to 2023. And so if we're going to understand this on a line, we need to go back to 9-11 and we see the symbols for 9-11 here. Or do we not? Remember, 9-11 also represents baptism, correct? Right. And he's going to go into an uncircumcised, you know, he's going to, like, obviously, the woman's not circumcised. But take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines, right? Which is the opposite of baptism. So we can see that the moral aspect, again, points to 9-11. But, but it, it points to 9-11 in both the positive and negative sense as well, because, I mean, we can see that the church takes on spiritual formation. But this movement is departing from that direction, right? That the message that Je Jeff lays down in the first angel's message allows us to not fall into the deception of the direction that the church is taking. It seems obvious now. Okay. <clears throat> and then, of course, we have that symbol of the 144,000. So, and also the symbol of Samson himself. But the 144,000, why would we tie that to 9 11? Because, I mean, the 144,000 are at the end of this line. I mean, we could say, not, you know, the 144,000 begin in 1989. But why would we put it at 9-11, that symbol? Isn't this a call to the, the 144,000? Okay, well... Yes. I mean, we know that the 144,000 is addressing the three angels' messages, right? In, in Revelation 14, we're going to have the 144,000 right at the beginning. And then these three angels' messages are given, and they're going to address the Sunday law, right? This is Revelation 18 as well, right? So Revelation 18 and, and if you look at Revelation 18, it's, it's a mirror of 81 as well, right? Because you got 18 this way and 81 this way. And so this is about the Sunday law. And this movement is about the Sunday law, giving a message to prepare God's people for the Sunday law. And the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down at 9-11. So, I mean, we could argue that, well, you know, that's July 18, you know, in the sense, but we know that this is all tied together from November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 2021 is a zoom into a particular way mark on our line. But our line is a zoom into the Sunday law. And the particular way mark in our line that is the Sunday law, represents the Sunday law, is 9-11, because that's where the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. It doesn't come down on November 9th, 1989. It comes down at September 11th, 2001. So we can see why these, these lines are tied together. You know, this is part of what we have to present this afternoon though we're not going to get very far today because uh, my idea is to move really slowly. Uh, but I do want to get across the idea of how when we zoom into a waymark, we don't have the structure of the lines as Parminder showed them, with them staggered in that way, where he tried to argue that each waymark does not or not typify another, where Jeff was saying all waymarks typify 
each other. And the reason they do that is because each way mark is a line in and of itself. But Parminder never had that. He wanted these staggered lines. He tried to make this nice and neat. Um, but which is not a fractal, right? That is fractalization is when you zoom into something, you see exactly the same thing. So basically to say that one way mark does not typify another is to actually reject the idea of a fractal, which we understand as a wheel within a wheel. As you zoom in closer, we, we see exactly the same pattern. We see a reform line. You zoom into a way mark, you're gonna see a reform line. And those way marks in that reform line, if you zoom in, you will see a reform line. And in fractals, you can do that infinitely, right? It would be a never ending uh, fractal. So, so here we have this, this situation where we can see that 9-11 is the Sunday law because the same symbol that Ellen White ties to the Sunday law occurs in our history at 9-11. And we saw that also in the story of, or in the presentations of A.T. Jones in 1893, where he sees the mighty angel of revelation coming down then. And, and that is, is correct, except that the church falls away. So that the work that is supposed to occur never occurs. But we are now in this in a repeat of that history within this movement. So we have this structure. So if we're going to put it in this history, if we're going to draw out this line, we have to put 9-11 as the beginning, but it's also 11-9. So 11-9 here being 11-9-2019, just as we did in chapter 13 that the two are tied together. Now then the riddle, the riddle is going to unfold in this history, right after July 18th, where exactly, um, whether that's gonna be, if we put December 25th here and, and the riddle unfolds afterwards, um, so when we look at this riddle again, um, what's, what's the purpose of this? Oops, I'm not in the right chapter. Book. Um, so the purpose of this riddle, why does it arise? What's the basis of it? Because we're gonna have this lion that's killed, right? Joshua, not Judges. Okay. Right. <clears throat> so we have this line killed. It gets this honey. We know the honey is the symbol of the little book, the message of the little book, because he eats it. Right? And he's going to give it to his father and mother. They're not going to know where it came from. But in 14, in 14, 5, we yeah. have the symbol also of the vineyards of Timna. Yeah. So that's the doctrine or teaching. Okay. The doctrine or teaching of those not of the children of Israel. Right. And then we're going to see the line of the tribe of Judah come and roar against him. Right. But right. it's a young lion. Why is it a young lion? Well, so the young line, because we looked at that, I mean, we looked at these different things, uh, these different verses dealing with the young line. Uh, we didn't complete it, but the young lion often represents Babylon in the sense that Assyria is a lion as well. And Babylon is seen as a young lion. Um, but this would be something new, like a Nero, a Neo- Assyrian Empire or Neo-Babylonian Empire, or in this Judah. case, this repeat of this message in our time. So to me, it's a repeat of a message because a young line descends from an older line. Judah is also a young line. Yep. Judah is a young line as well. 
So here we have Samson going down to Timnah mm -hmm. along with his mother and his father. Right? Yep. Now, the context is that Samson came to the vineyards of Timnah and behold, a young lion roared. And in the alternate reading, the young lion roared in meeting Samson. Yeah, encountering him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we're if we're taking this in the ironic sense, basically the young lion is repeating a message to Samson, but Samson decides that he doesn't like the message. Right. So, so there's a message that's been given to, to this movement, to this message, and there is a response against it. Right. So the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson, mm -hmm. and he rent him, so he rent the male lion. as he would have rent a kid and he had nothing in his hand. Why is it important that he had nothing in his hand? Well, we know that the, the number for hand is that 3,027 that we ran into in um, the 3,207 um, here it's 3,027, 3, the Hebrew number for hand. Right. We've noted that before. And in chapter 13, when we go from July 18th to this, um, from 9-11, 494 weeks, we come to this date that's 3,207 days after July 18th, which is a, a Passover. So, I mean, this map represents a message to the Levites. So he doesn't have a message to the Levites at this point. Well, but it's also interesting that even though he's going down to Timnah with his mother and his father, they don't see this occurring. And he tears the lion apart, and he doesn't tell them what he's done. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that they don't see that he kills the lion. What they don't see is that there's this honey in it. He doesn't tell them about the honey that's in the carcass later. But 14.6 said, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done after he'd killed the lion. Okay. Yeah. That's so it that's possible. That that that's what that's referring to. Yeah, so that's possible. But he he doesn't tell them about the riddle, so we know that. He doesn't tell them about what happened. Right. Okay, so yeah, so you could be correct. He could have. Uh, they, I, I don't know how they would not know that he killed the lion with, if they traveled with him. But now, a comment in the chat. It's kind of interesting. Young lion roared against the sum is two sixty four. So the twenty sixth day of the fourth month, mm -hmm. with the differential of sixty six. I just find the 26th day of the fourth month to be very, you know, very interesting application at this point. Well, that's July 18, so. Right. Okay. And, and we look at the message of July 18th as this message of the lion roaring. 
the young lion roaring is how I would understand it, because this is a prophetic message. No disagreement. Okay, so his father and his mother don't know that he killed this lion. Okay, so we're going to accept that. Now, he goes down, talks with the woman. She pleases Samson well. Um, so here uh, um, has to do with the eye. And again, that, that, that expression. So... His, so she looks good, whatever it is. And, and after a time, he returned to take her and he turned aside to see. And we, we're going to have to stop there. So we, at least we got a start here. It's going to take us a bit of time to take chapter 14 and finish this line. I don't think we're going to get it done uh, tomorrow morning. So um, thank everyone for coming uh, because, you know, we do have the study this afternoon at, at well, two o'clock, which is five hours from now. I'm not sure if everybody can make that study. It doesn't always fit in with everyone's schedule. <clears throat> but um, uh, if there are friends who you think might want to come, people in this movement that are on, you know, either the Canadian or American group who may not have know about the announcement or anything, um, if you feel impressed to invite someone to it, do so. Um, also, you know, I don't know how many people share the videos on their different forms of social media. Um, but uh, I'm going to try to make the study this afternoon uh, fairly simple and, and very basic and sort of open it up to to a broader audience than I would normally with these morning studies. It's obviously not something that somebody can jump into. And so, of course, anybody watching these videos, um, make sure that you share the videos with others. I'm not sure exactly how I'm gonna unfold it, but I'm gonna try to um, start very simply. Um, so, so we'll pick this up again tomorrow morning. When you say simply, um i'm going to be te like i'm teaching people in in uh you know elementary so when okay are, are, but are you directing this um at, at adventist right that's what you're doing you're directing this at adventist. Yeah, adventist but not necessarily people in this movement i want i get that but it's directed at adventist not just the open public well i mean yeah, I don't know. It depends on on the type of person. Mm, okay. Right. I mean, obviously, you it's know, about understanding and you know, being able to understand or even have some sort of comprehension of what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm going to start with some basic things. I'm, I'm um, you know, I look forward to listening to it. Yeah, it, it's hard for me to do things simply. I mean, even though I, I'm always thinking that I'm making things simple. Um, okay, so you fooled yourself. It's <laughs> always simpler, <laughs> right? I'm right. Everything I understand, um, right? So I'm always simplifying it. And now some people don't like that either, right? That is, when I say that, you know, what I present is complicated. I'm going to simplify it, and they still find it difficult. Uh, they can they can take that as a sort of a type of arrogance. But anyway, we're going to close with prayer. So, I mean, I put that message on there so that people watching this video can can understand if they want to share those videos with others. Of course, you right. can watch the video first and decide who you could share it with if you're just going to share the video. Because I'm talking about not so much inviting people to the study. Um, but sharing the video part of it, that uh, if you think the video is something you can share it. Okay, so uh, let's close. Hi. Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for the time that we have each morning. We ask for your Holy Spirit to continue to work upon our hearts and um, be with us throughout this day, especially this afternoon as we... Uh, begin a new study 
and um, we pray that you can use us to your glory. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.